Well, I would like to welcome you all to the uh, June uh, Wake Up Newport meeting uh, put on by the Chamber of Commerce. My name is Rush Hill, and I have the uh, responsibility when I'm in town of chairing this organization. Uh, we're going to have a, a great program this morning, as we always do. Uh, we'll start off with a, a sub-speaker and then get into our main speaker. Uh, but uh, we'd like to uh, welcome you and all the students from Harbor High and Corona Del Mar. Uh, do we have Corona Del Mar here today? Hello? Anybody from Corona Del Mar? <laughs> ah, all right. Well, Harbor wins again. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, glad to have you all here. So now it's my distinct pleasure. Of introduce Is there anyone standing to my left, by the way? Yeah. He's there, uh, the uh, mayor of the business community, uh, Stephen Rosansky. Thank you, Rush. Thank you, Rush. Rush was a former mayor as well of the city. So um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our uh, June edition of Wake Up Newport. I'm excited to hear our speaker, but we have a few uh, preliminary things we want to get out of the way first. So as usual, I'd like to introduce some of the dignitaries that have joined us this morning. So with us, we have our two uh, members of our city council. We have Diane Dixon in the back there. <laughs> Diane, former mayor as well. And Jeff Herdman right here. Uh, we have another former mayor, where's Keith Curry back there? <laughs> Keith and I and Rush all served together on the city council a few years back. Um, we have our fire chief with us this morning, Chip Duncan. We have my sister, or she, I'll call her my sister, but some people call her a civil service board member, Robin Grant's here. <laughs> uh, we also have Deborah, or Dorothy Larson, she's the let me get it right, president of the Library uh, Foundation Board. <laughs> Dorothy, over here. Uh, and as Rush had mentioned that, I guess Harbor won the Battle of the Bay here this morning, and we have a lot of Harbor students with their DECA club, and Sheridan Hurst, their uh, advisors in the back. Also with us this morning, um, uh, council hopeful, Tim Stokes, Tim Stokes. And we just had an election here. It wasn't for the city council, but Tim's running for city council. We have four city council members up for re-election, including Diane. I guess I should mention that too. Diane, you're running for city council too. <laughs> Re-upping, huh, for another four, year, four more years? You liked it that much, huh? Okay. You guys aren't bugging her enough if she's willing to run for four more years. <laughs> Call Diane. So uh, right now I want to introduce our series sponsor of uh, Wake Up Newport. It's Credit Union of Southern California. Got it right this time. Uh, Dee Dee, you want to come up and join us and tell us about what's going on? What kind of great loan programs? You got any student loans? These guys are all headed to college, I think most of them. You don't have student loans? Oh, come on, you got to get them. I'll be sure and mention that. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dee Dee. I am the branch manager of the office right upstairs here across from the cafe. We do have a branch office here as well as a branch in Costa Mesa on Harbor and 19th. So we're very close. CU SoCal has 19 branches throughout Southern California, so if you live, work, worship, or go to school in LA, Orange, or Riverside County, you are eligible to join our credit union. We are full service, so we can help you with whatever you need. Just come and see me. Thank you. Thank you, Dee Dee. She's running back and forth between those two branches. I hope they're paying you a little bit more money with all this extra work, right? I mean, interest rates are going up. They gotta be making more money over there, okay. Um, also, uh, we have a, our food sponsor this morning is Panini it, ha, it, Kebab Grill, or gr okay, uh, I got it right, there we go, and we have our district manager, Jose Jimenez, and he's going to come up here and tell us a little bit about Panini and what's going on over there. I know we have several of them around this area. I go to, I go to Corona Del Mar usually, but uh, we also go to uh, Jamboree, so. Morning, everyone. My name is Jose, district manager, Orange County. Uh, we brought some food for you guys to have breakfast today. As, as Jim said, we're opening, we're opening several paninis all, all around. We're also franchising. As you, I don't know if you guys had the opportunity to try our food, but we're, we're mainly based on Scratch Kitchen, all healthy. Everything is done fresh daily. So seven days a week, we receive everything daily. So our chefs prepare everything from scratch from the moment we get there. So 
I mean, help yourself, there's, there's great food. I mean, we just opened Mission Viejo, if you're ever in that area, and we're gonna be opening soon somewhere near you, but the closest one will be Coronel Mar, so please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Yeah, I usually, like you said, I check out the one at Coronel Mar. It's, the food's always great, and the service is wonderful there, too. So uh, before I turn it back over to Rush, we do have one uh, other speaker that I invited this morning um, who's been to the Orange County Fair. Everybody, I hope not. Come on, what's up with that? So this morning, we have the CEO of the Orange County Fair with us, Kathy Kramer. Where's Kathy? Did she? There she is. Come on up, Kathy. So the fair is going to start soon. She's going to tell you a little bit about the exciting things going on over there. And come on. Thank you, Steve. Good morning. Was that show of hands of who has been to the fair? All right. Love it. Perfect. Well, you, um, you're, you'll be familiar with all the regular stuff, but I'm going to talk about some of the new stuff. So as Steve said, in 36 days, we open one of Orange County's most anticipated summer events, the annual OC Fair. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to provide a sneak peek of some of the great new things happening this year. But before I do that, um, I want to start with some OC Fair trivia. Um, and this is audience participation. I bet you guys didn't know that the OC Fair in is the second largest fair in California, and we're the eighth in North America. And this is all back in our own backyard. So now I have a trivia question for you. Let's do it by show of hands. Steve, you're going to be a participant. Um, this trivia question, you are going to get win a four-pack of admission tickets um, and VIP parking, just the parking itself. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So you're going to, I'm not going to be the bad guy. You are. You're going to figure out who raised their hand first when I answer the question. All right? No, 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 no. Okay. It's actually two questions. How many days does the OC Fair run and what is the average attendance of the annual OC Fair? No, I, I would be dead. <laughs> No, how many people attend over the run of the fair? You guys have, you guys have cell phones, a little tip there. OCFair.com. That's okay. 22,000 a day, is that close? I want to know how many days do we run? How many days can you go to the OC Fair? And over the course of those days, how many people attend? Close, oh, okay, 20. I'm gonna give it to this lady right here. She's pretty close. She's pretty close. It's 23. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and give it to her. She's pretty close. It's um, 23 days and over 1.3 million people. So you can imagine in 23 days, we, 23 and 1.3 million people come to the OC Fair. So, Total, exactly. Average 1.3. Our theme this year is free your inner farmer. We're going to focus on how the guests can learn more about where their food comes from and agricultural in general. Um, and even in an urban environment, how you can plant, harvest, and enjoy food. Who loves all the crazy, wonky concoctions? Raise your hand if you can't wait in 36 days, all right? Well, let me share with you some of the new deep-fried bacon-wrapped concoctions. So get ready. We have a chocolate pasta, a spaghetti donut. This one, now the name's going to be real catchy, the pineapple and pork, and the name of it's called the pine and swine. Ooh, it's sourdough bread, frozen Reese's cream pie, deep fried filet mignon on a stick, okay, I hope that fits on the menu board, spicy fried cheese curd chips, and bomb pops in a cup. So add those to your list of your favorites. You won't be disappointed. We have an amazing summer series, Pacific Amphitheater. Who's been to a concert in the Pacific Amphitheater? Pretty special. It's an 82 seat 8,200 seat outdoor amphitheater. And another little trivia question, that amphitheater ranks in the top 15 in the whole United States by gross sales and tickets, again, right in your own backyard. 
Some of the concerts this year include Steve Martin and Martin Short. When the team told me they were booking that one, I kind of scratched my head, but I had to trust their expertise, and they were spot on because I believe that concert is sold out. Uh, Brent Eldridge, if he's not sold out, close to. Willie Nelson and Alison Krauss, um, that one's definitely sold out. I promise I'll tell you some, but you can still buy tickets. Hunter Hayes, um, let's see, who else? Uh, Trevor Noah, and we also, um, we concerts are every day of the fair, so 23 concerts, the Toyota Summer Concert Series, but we do concerts pre-fair and post-fair. So in all, we'll do 31 concerts um, this season. Of that, if you don't know also, one of our newest um, partners is the Pacific Symphony. They have moved their come summer series over, so if you're interested, um, you can attend their first concert, which is the 4th of July, where the symphony will play to uh, Chicago music with the symphony. So it's a, it's a pretty fantastic event. So get your tickets. Also, if you come to, you know, um, the hangar, who's been to an event in the hangar? Knows where the hangar? Okay, you guys are you guys are old pros. Hangar is famous for the trivia bands. So again, that's um, a very affordable way to see some of those old trivia bands. One of the goals at the OC Fair is to make the fair affordable to everyone. Some of the promotions we have a new promotion this year that kind of ties it. It ties into our theme. It's called free your free your inner farmer. If you come on Thursdays in your overalls, you get free admission. So make a note of that. Dig those out of your closets or go to the Goodwill, wherever you find them. Um, another new promotion that we're doing that's very family-oriented on Sundays, it's called Sunday Fun Day. You get half-price admission and a $35 unlimited wristband. So if you've got some, some kids, that's a great value. You can ride the rides as many times as they want until 4 o'clock. So visit our website. There's all kinds of ways to save at the OC Fair. So my last trivia question... And this is for, dun, 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 let's let him think here, Steve. This is for one of our pre-fair concerts. This is a band called, or they're actually an all-male a cappella group, and they're called Straight No Chaser. No, this is not off a drink menu, I promise, but Straight No Chaser. So let's going to figure out. So your trivia question is, what are the dates of the OC Fair this year? Ooh, there's a hand back there. Yep, perfect. We have a winner, July 12th through, July 13th through August 12th. Thank you. Well, before I say, um, back in the back table, there are um, brochures, talks about all of the events. Also, there are some coupons for $2 discounts. And where are all my students? Raise your hand, the students. Okay. Do you have a summer job yet? No? Do your parents want you to have a summer job? <laughs> Well, if they do, best summer job ever. We're still hiring, 23 days of fun. One of the perks when you um, work at the OC Fair is you have an opportunity to buy up to 20 admission tickets for a dollar. So our um, seasonal employees really like that. So students, I expect you all to pick up one of these. I gave this to your instructor, Sheridan. We've already connected. So between her and I, we're going to get you all recruited for the best summer job ever. So... Um, thank you for the opportunity to share some of the great things coming at the um, annual OC Fair. And I hope to see all of you out there. And for more information, please visit ocfair.com. So come and enjoy your fair. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. All right, so I'm going to turn this back over. Oh, actually, one other introduction. I want to introduce the new chair of our board, Sam El Raba, in the back there. Sam's the general manager of the Balboa Bay Resort. He just took over, like, Friday as the chair of the board, June 1st. So thank you, Sam, for coming this morning. All right, Rush, why don't you come up here, and we'll uh, get started with our program. Well, this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, we have uh, a very interesting uh, topic and a very interesting speaker. Um, Hogue Hospital is a very important part of uh, this community, both from a health care as well as an economic engine. Uh, I just realized in hearing about our fair that uh, the food that's served there is sponsored by Hogue as part of their marketing program. Uh, that's not true, but uh, at least I don't think it is. Uh, people have a way of underwriting things and you don't even know about it. <clears throat> but uh, um, uh, how many people have been on an airplane? 
uh, how many people read those airplane magazines because <clears throat> you have nothing else to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Get my nose fixed, my mouth doesn't work. <clears throat> well, uh, this morning we have a speaker that's listed in the Best Doctors of America. You all see that section in, in the magazine, and, uh, and to have one in this room this morning, this time, is absolutely incredible. Uh, one of 10 in the uh, country, uh, top doctor by the US News and World Report. Uh, Dr. Brandt uh, Zawoski has uh, served over 200 papers, numerous textbooks, and uh, a variety of educational boards for professional journals and still on numerous professional organization boards and committees. Uh, he lectures internationally, uh, has supervised numerous postdoctorate fellows, leads and participates in various research projects. He's a fellow with the American College of Radiology, a gold medal recipient from the Society of Magnetic Res Res Residence, thank you, uh, in medicine and is listed in the Best Doctors of America and the Top Doctor by U.S. and News Report. He earned his B.A. at Stanford University and his M.D. from Medical uh, University of, of Cincinnati, graduating first in his class. Uh, his residency in diagnostic radiology and subsequent fellowship in neurodiology neuro at Stanford University, where he remains adjunct faculty on that campus. He served as a full-time professor for, two year, for six years in the Department of Radiology at the University of California, San Francisco, and he's been the medical director of radiology at Hogue for over 10 years. He earned a certificate in leadership for healthcare transformation from UC Irvine's Paul Mirage School of Business, and he is the founder and consultant to, uh, the, the founder and consultant to a number of companies in the biotechnical radiology fields. Um, I will say one other thing is that uh, uh, he also holds the Ron and Sandy Simon Endowed Chair as the Executive Medical Director of Hogue Neuroscience Institute. Now, I would share with you what he does on a daily basis, but there are words bigger than I could ever get through at 7.30 in the morning. So with that, I'm going to let uh, Michael Brandt Zawoski tell you himself as to what he does. I think you'll find this very exciting and very interesting. Doctor? Well, I don't know who he was talking about. That's, uh, I don't recognize that person. Uh, I'm just uh, uh, proud to be a Hogue uh, employee and a resident of Newport Beach, with, where I was dragged by my wife back in 1986. Uh, hometown girl, and uh, uh, been growing up with this community and with Hoke Hospital. So let me tell you a little bit about Hoke, because this topic I'm about to discuss is a, maybe a little bit on the dark side, and I want to start with the lighter side. Uh, since coming to Hoke um, over 30 years ago, I've seen it grow from a community, uh, sleepy, frankly, hospital, where I first uh, realized it existed was uh, my father-in-law was uh, in the intensive care unit, uh, uh, overdosed on drugs and alcohol, and that's how I was introduced to uh, Hogue Hospital. And I'm going to talk about that topic later, but I want to tell you a little bit where Hogue's come from since those days. Um, the hospital was a three-story affair back then. Um, the intensive care unit was very industrial looking, to say the least. Over the years, Hogue has really emerged as one of the top hospitals and healthcare systems uh, in uh, the country, believe it or not. Uh, now with the second campus uh, in Irvine, Hogue Hospital Irvine. Uh, just to very briefly, the uh, most recent U.S. News and World Report magazine, which ranks over 4,500, all the hospitals, frankly, in the United States. You've seen those rankings for colleges. The kids, I'm sure, have seen and those, when they're look, looking to select colleges, they also um, rank hospitals. Um, Hogue was uh, named uh, for the LA Orange County Basin, all of LA, all of Orange County. Hogue was named in the top three, uh, the top three being UCLA, Cedars, and Hogue Hospital. Uh, that was last, the very last ranking by US News and World Report. 
uh, a heart and vascular institute, uh, one of the top 50 heart and vascular centers in the country, um, uh, ranked by an entity called Truveen that again ranks and uh, scores uh, these entities. Our neurosciences, uh, neurosurgery and, and spine services in the top 100 in the country. So over the last uh, 32 years, Hogue has really emerged and it's, uh, it's always, grass is always greener, so folks still go to the Mayos and still go to MD Anderson for their cancer care, but I can tell you, as now being the senior physician executive at Hogue Hospital and overseeing all the specialized uh, services uh, at Hogue for quality and, and development, as senior physician executive, I can tell you that I would not uh, send anyone anywhere for in, almost anything other than heart transplants, which we don't do. We obviously don't do pediatrics because we have Children's Hospital of Orange County that we partner with. They were actually on our campus seeing kids in a, in a chalk clinic. So we partner with chalk, but other than uh, heart transplants, bone marrow transplants, which should be done in, in highly uh, selected uh, locales, Hogue is, uh, is a destination, in fact, not just a local hospital, but people come to us for their care from many places, uh, not just around the country, but even around the world. So it's, it's, I'm very proud to be representing Hogue, uh, Hogue here. Uh, but back to how I was introduced to Hogue, uh, used to be that alcohol was, uh, was, a, was, was the problem that we were all faced with, but every day in our news media, we see examples of uh, the growing epidemic of mental illness. And uh, some people call it behavioral health problems. What a misnomer, behavioral health. What does that mean? Uh, what is, be what is, is that bad behavior when, when you have an alcohol problem or is it an illness just like diabetes? Well. So the Neurosciences Institute at Hogue, and I heard uh, some, the manager of uh, Balboa Bay Resort is here, I believe. And so the, the Neurosciences Institute recently was renamed the Pickup Family Neurosciences Institute. Um, Dick Pickup and his family, tremendously generous, recognizing the major um, impact of uh, mental health and cognitive health in our seniors. Um, and the work that Neurosciences Institute at Hogue has done um, gave us an extremely generous gift and named the institute. Uh, so it is now the Pickup Family Neurosciences Institute at Hogue. And uh, when I became executive medical director, the Ron and Sandy Simon chair of that institute, one of the first things I looked at was how we could expand our mental health services because I personally knew from my family and from families around me that this was a hidden problem. No one wanted to talk about it. And yes, so oh, by the way, I had a drug rehab next door to my house for three or four years. So I learned even more acutely what the impact on the community and the residents of this issue could be. So at Hogue, uh, dating back to 30 years, we had a little detox unit where people who um, were uh, overdosing on alcohol would come and dry out. A classic old detox unit. I worked in one in my, in my med school years to earn, earn a little bit of money. It was kind of like working at the fair, except it was helping, <laughs> helping alcoholics dry out, uh, you know, doing, taking out the garbage, making their beds, et cetera, et cetera. So detox units were, uh, were kind of the, uh, the standard fare for, for the, the baseline, if you will, of uh, mental health issues. And I didn't realize it at the time. Um, but uh, 30 years of a detox unit and no one at the hospital even knew we had it because people didn't really want to talk about it, even though there, there was a very you know, well-run and, uh, and very well-respected and appreciated detox unit. But in the neurosciences, uh, we decided to shine some light on this issue because alcohol and increasingly other drug substances are really self-medication for an underlying mental health illness, an illness which is rooted in the chemistry and the wiring of your brains. So it is an illness, a medical illness, and for decades has been treated as a behavioral problem with behavioral interventions, peer-to-peer -peer interventions, like the 12 steps, of AA, Alcohol Anonymous, which is great. We need the social component, the peer component, but we also need to link into it the medical model, which was for so long not even 
paying attention to the fact that these drug problems are really, including alcohol, are really rooted in the chemistry and the wiring of the brain. As a neuroradiologist, I, I knew that, learned that in my training. Just to give you some statistics before we talk about what we're doing about it at Hogue, over 142,000 Americans in 2016 died from either alcohol-related fatalities, drug overdose, or suicide. That's Imagine the city of Newport Beach disappearing over a year, more than this, right? Newport is how many? Uh, Rush, help me. 187.5, that's all? Jeez, with Newport Coast and all of that, we thought we'd hit 100. That's not counting Steve Rosansky's That's not counting Steve Rosansky's family, I see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but imagine the city of Newport Beach and a half, okay? Uh, one and a half Newport beaches disappearing in one year because just because of alcohol-related fatalities, overdoses, and suicide. Uh, that's, what, three Vietnam Wars worth of deaths. So you hear about the war on drugs. The scale is not necessarily out of proportion. That's an 11% year-over-year increase from one year to the next in terms of deaths from those conditions. It's leading to an unprecedented, unprecedented fall in life expectancy. So you always hear about the, how the American healthcare system is not so good because people in other countries that uh, don't spend as much money on healthcare live longer. Well, one of the reasons we live less long is we're killing ourselves with uh, alcohol and drug problems. In fact, uh, how it impacts our hospital or the hospitals around the country one out of three of adult hospital admissions include a mental health or and or substance abuse comorbidity. One out of three people in our hospital today and around the country have a problem with either a mental health or a drug challenge. And that's also true for teenagers. Kids, one out of four of teenage admissions to the hospital include those. And uh, I will tell you that over 50% of mental illness starts in the teenage years. So we've got to move upstream because it's not recognized, that mental illness is not recognized on the average for eight to 10 years. So when we first hear about uh, someone with a mental health challenge, they tend to be in their early 20s, maybe in college. Although the occasional teen suicide like happened a stone's throw from here, one of the CDM kids you've all read about a few months ago, Occasionally that props up, but everyone thinks that's an aberration. Well, I'm here to tell you it is not, and we're doing something about that. Now, opioids are increasingly becoming the method of choice for uh, 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 abuse and also uh, the cause of death. So of the 64,000 drug overdose deaths in the country last year, for over 40,000 were due to opioid prescription medication and occasionally heroin, although heroin is increasing as we're fighting the drug uh, wars in the hospital setting, trying to cut down prescription drugs, uh, prescription opioids. Um, so uh, the, the statistics there are, are also uh, remarkable in terms of 64% increase in opioid-related hospitalizations year over year, 64% increase, and uh, the, uh, that includes uh, uh, um, even mothers, pregnant moms, uh, increasingly seen, even on our wards, uh, addicted to opioid medication and, and or heroin. And this is not a problem of the underprivileged. 80, over 80% 80 um, of the opioid deaths are occurring in the non-Hispanic white population. And again, the problem starts at home. Uh, how many of you have been to the dentist recently? Okay, how many of you got an opioid prescription from the dentist for a root canal? I did. <laughs> I got 30 Vicodin prescribed to me for a root canal, which you know, I could have easily taken care of with Advil. I asked my dentist, why are you doing this? He said, well, I do it for everybody. Why? Because dentists and doctors back in the 90s were taught that we aren't doing enough to treat pain in our patients. In fact, one of our scorecards in the hospital up until two years ago was how well did you control your patient's pain while, uh, while they were in the hospital? 
Patient satisfaction scores included that. When patients got a little questionnaire, they got a questionnaire from national agencies saying, how well was your pain controlled while you were in the hospital? And if they said not so well, the hospitals got dinged in terms of reimbursement. Finally, this last year, that question was taken off the, pay, the scorecard so that we quit over-prescribing uh, medication uh, to our patients for, for pain control. So uh, given the stark statistics and the dark statistics I just discussed with you, uh, what can we do about this as a health system? Well, we, the first thing we can do is partner with our communities because it really is a community issue. It's a edu community education issue. Uh, it's a community partnership issue with our healthcare organizations. So I'm going to ask Cambria Hittleman, who is our director for all neurobehavioral, we've changed the term from behavioral health to neurobehavioral health, all of our neurobehavioral activities at Hogue to come up and give you, an ex uh, give you a perspective on what we're doing in neurobehavioral health at Hogue to combat both the mental health uh, epidemic and the associated substance abuse epidemic at Hogue Hospital. Cambria, come on up. Cambria came to us from, um, uh, Cambria came to us uh, initially from Berkeley. Uh, she's a graduate of that institution. She has a uh, psych D, uh, she's a doc, she has a doctorate of clinical psychology. Uh, and she's uh, run both the mental health ward in uh, downtrodden Brooklyn uh, and various uh, facilities uh, that uh, help uh, patients with neurobehavioral disorders. And uh, Cambria can tell you what uh, specifically we're doing to address mental health challenges in our community through uh, partnerships with uh, uh, our school system uh, and others uh, and what our plans are at Hoke Hospital. So Cambria. Good morning. Um, we have uh, four different service lines currently at Hoke under the neurobehavioral health umbrella. We have our Hoke addiction treatment programs which are, uh, which we see the full continuum of the patient. We first have our detox unit, which has 21 beds. After detox, we then have our residential unit, which is Solmar, a 30-day program, residential program on Hoag site to treat addiction. We then have our partial hospitalization program, which is six days a week for nine hours a day. So you um, get to leave at night, but you do come for programming six days a week. And then we have a variety of um, intensive outpatient programs to meet your needs. We have our transitional, which is nine to 12, three days a week. We have our day program, which is a full day, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then evening IOP, both at Irvine and at Newport Beach. We have continuing care services, which means you come back on site and you meet with our continuing care counselors and our alumni. We have 300 active alumni program, um, patients in our program that come for various panels and meetings. We then have our Aspire program, which is for children and adolescents. We have 13 to 17 year olds, um, intensive outpatient treatment on our Newport campus, and we will be having our Irvine open shortly. We've partnered with uh, Costa Mesa School District to start the integrating into the schools. We have another meeting with them next Friday to see how we can better partner with them as well as other districts in the school. We'll be meeting with Irvine, um, I think, in the fall to see how we can integrate there as well. Um, we also have our consult and liaison services, which are our psychiatrists that deal with all of our patients on the inpatient unit and in the ER when they're in crisis. Um, and then we also have our outpatient maternal mental health services. That is our outpatient program for perinatal and postpartum individuals that um, can come to us while they're pregnant and then see our psychiatrist and our um, therapist for about a year postpartum. So those are the current service lines that we have at Hogue, and we're developing them with our foundation and our advisory board to meet our, uh, all of our patients and community needs. So uh, Cambria has uh, Cambria's, uh, been an incredible find for us. She manages all of those services uh, and manages the people. Uh, you know, I've learned in, in, in my life as an administrator that it's, it's the, all about the three Ps, people, process, and politics. And people are the hardest part, right? So um, uh, speaking of politics uh, and, and uh, 
the community. So as it's no secret to folks here from Costa Mesa and Newport that we are the Rehab Riviera, right? That we've done, that earned that term because of the proliferation of what I call really treatment facilities uh, in the private sector that cater to the tremendous need for, for uh, drug and alcohol uh, recovery. Now that said, the industry is quite spotty and th there's great variability in how these folks are, are treated in these various uh, facilities. Some are terrific, some are not so terrific. Uh, and the result of that uh, can be daunting, particularly to a hospital system uh, where there's a proliferation in the community. So in our community, um, we have some not so good operators and our emergency room suffers from that. So any night in our emergency room, uh, approximately 20% of the capacity of our emergency room is taken up by folks with mental health or drug problems. Not just related to the industry, but it's just a statistic you heard me cite earlier. But imagine that 20% of an emergency room's capacity that should be dealing with heart attacks, appendix attacks, um, you know, um, broken bones, obstructed bowels, 20% of that capacity is taken up by folks who should be in a non-emergency room facility um, for medical care, but in an emergency or crisis facility for mental health or, or substance abuse care. We're working with the Orange County supervisors to create more crisis centers, and there's only one county-sponsored uh, crisis center right now with 13 beds. Hogue is part of an Orange County coalition uh, that aims to really expand mental health services throughout Orange County. Orange County has been a laggard in providing um, facilities specifically. We have the fewest number of mental health beds and crisis beds uh, of any, almost any county in, in the country, and including the, the uh, California. So we're starting to fix that and Hogue is part of that coalition. Um, and as I said earlier, about one out of three, uh, one out of three patients on our floors there for either a heart condition or cancer or something also has a mental health challenge. So we need to expand our facilities. A little bit of a plea to the city council members here, and we may be coming to the city council soon to expand the, the facilities on the Hogue campus uh, to help accommodate our, our mental health challenges. Uh, I'm talking about a new building. Um, on the lower campus, which uh, will hopefully not aggravate our neighbors on the cliff too much. We'll keep it below the line of sight, et cetera, but we may be coming to the council and hopefully there'll be more understanding uh, in terms of that given the statistics and the need I mentioned. But really the only area, you know, hospitalizations are decreasing throughout the country because there's a trend towards outpatient care. We're getting better and better at minimally invasive care for medical and surgical conditions. You don't need to be in a hospital. The only area of increasing hospitalization throughout the country is mental health. Now, folks with mental health and substance abuse challenges. That's the only area of increasing uh, uh, per capita hospitalization. So we need to uh, create more uh, uh, space, both as a county uh, and as, uh, as Hoke Hospital. Now, so uh, I want to emphasize the Aspire program because of the kids in the audience. So the after-school program uh, is meant to address the issue I stated earlier that over 50% of mental health challenges start in the teenage years. And you may, uh, it may be as simple as noticing that someone is addicted to their video games and spending an inordinate amount of time in their room watching video games rather than interacting socially. It was interesting to me when my kids uh, were growing up, you know, they grew up after, after cell phones, which is amazing. We didn't have the cell phone until, you know, 15 years ago, really. And so uh, I would come down to the, to the living room and a bunch of my son's friends would be sitting there texting each other on the couch, right? Uh, they were there, you know, together and they were, they were looking at their cell phones and texting each other. And I thought to myself, that's interesting. And how isolating is it to be, able, on the one hand, the internet has connected everybody. And so you would think that it's a medium that has allowed socialization, the social media, right? Socialization to expand. But the flip side of that is it's really isolating for you to be interacting with a device rather than a person. So in a sense, the social media is desocializing our young people and our, all of us, in, in fact. 
It's so much harder to communicate by email or text. You don't have the emotion, you don't have the body language, you don't have the eye contact. It is really, in a way, dehumanizing. And I'm wondering if that's not a component of what's contributing uh, to the rapid rise of mental health challenges in our community. So the kids, uh, it's where it starts. So our Aspire After School Program for Resiliency in Education is a wonderful program because it allows access in a setting where uh, it is social. It is a group setting uh, for kids who feel challenged or whose parents and or teachers may feel being challenged through the very difficult uh, years of transition between childhood and adulthood. Uh, and those are not easy years. Your brain is still plastic. Uh, your wiring is still being congealed. It's not complete. You have, your brains haven't matured. Uh, they're wiring around your brains, particularly in the frontal lobes where all the executive decision functions are made. Uh, isn't wired in yet. And so the environment can affect the development of the brain. And the environment, not just your genetics, can affect the wiring of your brain as you go from ages 12 to 24. It's, we're not mature in our brains until then. So no wonder kids have poor judgment uh, in their teenage years because the judgment areas of the brain aren't fixed yet. And so if you impact those areas with toxic substances or stimuli, that make connections between parts of the brain that shouldn't be made, things can go haywire in a sense. So our Aspire program is, is uh, to us, uh, which we just uh, restarted, is the critical way to go upstream and address mental health challenges, hopefully in an effort to stop the growth and the epidemic of uh, mental health illness and substance abuse challenges in, in, our, in our society. And the other thing we can do is as, as a society and as, as a civic uh, leadership structure of a, of a city council and an Orange County Board of Supervisors is we can look at the environment that we're creating. Uh, you know, whether, whether now with the, with, the, you know, with the fact that marijuana has become legalized, uh, do we really want uh, people smoking pot on our streets, unabridged? We don't let people drink on our streets, do, you want, do we want to allow people to smoke pot on our streets? Is that, is that something that should be regulated somehow? Um, I'm not saying that the marijuana is a gateway drug to other drugs. Uh, I think marijuana potentially has some medical uses that should be used very ju judiciously. But again, it is a substance that affects how your brain's being wired as you're growing up. Should we allow our teenagers as liberal access to marijuana and, out, as, and alcohol as we do today. Um, or the drugs that are sitting in your parents' cabinet from a dentist. You know, so we really have to, as a society and as a uh, civic uh, uh, leadership structure, have to look at uh, what, our, what our approach to regulation is. I hate, I hate to use that word because, you know, in one way, uh, we all want to be free and uh, independent of uh, unfettered and make our own decisions. That said, I think sometimes, as uh, Steve Jobs once said, sometimes we have to show our customers what they need. Um, and uh, Steve Jobs made a, a fortune and built a, one of the world's best companies out of uh, really, uh, really tremendous marketing. And I would call this marketing. Education is marketing in a way. Uh, to, to our population. I'm going to stop here because I'm getting too far astray. Any questions for Cambria and myself around this issue? Yes, sir. How does our mental health drug uh, situation compare to other countries, say uh, Western Europe or Asia or whatever? Cambria, you want to tackle that? I will, I, will I will tell you an interesting fact. Do you know what the life expectancy of a Russian male is? Anybody care to guess? Uh, a, a Russian male, average life expectancy. Is it, how many would say over 60? You're all wrong. It's like 59. And do you know why? Vodka. Yeah, and vodka you know, I'm Polish. Uh, so, you know, it's, to us it's like water, right? 
Uh, but uh, so, so that's one answer to your question. So there are some places that are worse than us, but there are some places that are way, way, way better. Okay. So I think one of the ways to, that people are controversially addressing the opioid epidemic is to create um, safe places for addicts uh, to, uh, to, uh, to use drugs. And so the Scandinavian countries, uh, Switzerland has uh, created uh, facilities, and the idea is that they, are, that they won't spread disease, that, that they can, they, the crime uh, associated with those substances is, is diminished because there's easier legal access, and flipping them to a, uh, to a maintenance program of substitute drugs. So there are substitute opioids that can be given to heroin and uh, narcotic addicts that are maintenance drugs uh, that are, that are um, and so again, this is controversial because some people will say you're substituting one type of drug for another, but th these drugs don't produce the same kinds of euphoric effects that uh, require people to take more and more and more, right, and lead to the potential for overdose. So substituting a safer, more controlled way of controlling um, their, their need for, uh, for these drugs, and then hopefully putting them into programs that over time uh, take them off those drugs. Uh, the countries are approaching that, but I will tell you that the U.S. is uh, uh, statistically now in a, in a uh, in the, in the rate of increase of substance abuse in the U.S. is amongst the highest in the world. And some people blame China for that, and some people actually think, because that's where a lot of the synthetic opioids are manufactured and some of the, the other synthetic drugs, they think it's a political strategy. Those are the conspiracy theorists, but uh, given the, what we know, uh, most of opioid production happens in the Middle East and in China, uh, synthetics in particular, and some people are wondering you know, if that's not a political, politically motivated um, strategy. Uh, well, so briefly, the, uh, the so briefly, the um, uh, all opioids uh, derive from a poppy that's grown, uh, a flower, right? It's a plant, and so it's a naturally occurring substance in a plant. Many, <clears throat> excuse me, many of our medications, digitalis, a heart medication, comes from foxglove, a plant. So opioids uh, are. Uh, uh, the, basically, uh, phar pharmaceutical entities take the plant and derive that original substance um, and turn it into morphine and, or into OxyContin or into, so it's natural. And then the, the chemists get into it and look at the molecule and say, hey, we, can, we don't need the plant to synthesize uh, a drug that looks very similar. They substitute a carbon atom here in the laboratory or there and create a drug that looks very similar but doesn't require the natural plant to manufacture the drug. So those are the synthetics. Okay? Yes, sir. With some of the rising and the high profile violence by young males, would you consider that more of a, you know, a mental? So that's a good question. And I, I think I know what, what, let me try and interpret it. So every day we read about school shootings or a van in Toronto mowing down 12 people. And uh, you know, some, sometimes it's ascribed to terrorism. Um, and it turns out that the majority are younger male perpetrators. It's rare that a woman does that. Now recently we had a young woman go up to, was it Google? Uh, or no, it was the, one of the music uh, pen, pen. YouTube. It was YouTube, um, uh, the corporate uh, uh, building in San Francisco, and shoot you know herself before she shot. After she shot four or five other people, that was a very unusual occurrence for a woman to do that. But they okay, occasionally women do this too. But young males uh, seem to be the perpetrators in many of these. And so the question is: Is it a combination of hormonal? Um, genetic interaction in their mental illness, but there's no question in my mind that uh, the, the pro-gun people who say it's not the gun, it's the brain, 
uh, there's partial truth to that, right? So yes, it would be wonderful if we could get rid of guns uh, uh, inappropriately in the hands of uh, uh, anyone who shouldn't have them, particularly those with mental health challenges. But then you have the stabbings. Then then you have you know. So uh, it, it, the answer is yes. Uh, some of the violence that we're seeing uh, almost incredibly daily in, in, in our in our country. Uh, stems from the mental health uh, illness uh, challenges that that uh, that are rising in our society, and so again, another compelling reason for Hogue and the community and everyone to uh, get, uh, work together to stem this uh, rising tsunami of uh, mental illness in our communities. Well, we are absolutely uh, honored to have uh, uh, intelligence such as this in our community, to have Hoke Hospital in our community. Uh, it's a, obviously a very serious uh, issue, uh, an issue that's growing in importance, and I think we need to spend a lot more time talking about it. Uh, I first became aware of the issue when I was uh, uh, in state government, and uh, they circulated around the office. Someone had answered a questionnaire of their corporation and uh, on the count of different uh, employees and, uh, and it uh, had uh, one of the questions of employees uh, broken down by sex and uh, the person wrote no, but alcohol was a problem. So uh, you didn't get that joke, did you? Well, <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> uh, we uh, are appreciative doctor of, of your presentation and hope that you have the opportunity of delivering that message to many more groups. Now. Is someone standing to my left again? Oh, yes. Uh, it is my distinct uh, requirement. Hey, watch his mouth move. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, invite back to the dais uh, our closer, uh, Dr. Rosansky. Yeah. Thank you. There actually is a Dr. Rosansky. If you Google it, another Stephen Rosansky is a doctor somewhere. Uh, so just quickly, I know you guys are in a rush to get back to school. Not, but whatever. So we have a few events coming up uh, the next uh, month. I'll just quickly run through them. Next Friday, for those of you uh, who do want to have a beer or a glass of wine, but just one, uh, we have our barbecue by the lake uh, at our offices. That starts at 430, and our offices are at 4, uh, 4343 Von Carmen. You're welcome to come and bring, uh, bring a friend. Our business education lunch will be June uh, 20th. Um, at Fleming's, I think, from 11.30 to 1.30. You can get information on that on our website. All these uh, activities at newportbeach.com. Um, June 21st, if you didn't get enough uh, of Wake Up Newport, we have government affairs. Um, our government affairs meeting It is only open to chamber members, though, so if you're not a chamber member, you've got to see Jim and sign up, and then you can come to that as well. But our speaker on the school theme uh, is uh, Dr. Fred Navarro, the superintendent of schools. So he's going to be talking, and that's at 8 a.m. Um, our mixer this month, who's been to the new theater over at uh, Fashion Island the lot yet? It's great. I've been there a couple times. Uh, it's, you wouldn't even know there's a movie theater there anymore. It's a huge restaurant, and, and the theaters are, are wonderful. So our mixer is going to be there on June 28th at 530. Um, Looks like uh, into July, you know, it's 4th of July, so we're going to push some of our meetings a week. Uh, July 10th is our Marine Committee meeting. It's 530 at Marina Park. Next month at Wake Up Newport, how many people know that our city manager is retiring at the end of August? Dave Kiff? Okay, well, he's going to make a final appearance here at Wake Up Newport on July 12th. So don't come the first Thursday. That's July 5th. I don't think too many people are going to come after 4th of July. So we, we pushed it a month. But July 12th at Wake Up Newport, Dave Kiff. I want to thank Panini Grill. There's still some stuff back there. Grab some on your way out. And um, let's all go to the fair and have some pine and swine, right? Take care. We'll see you next month. <laughs>